praise the Lord right where you are. Hallelujah. This has been an amazing week in your life and mine. Y'all like, how do you know that? Because you're alive. Because you're still here. You're breathing this day. God has given you provision for this day. There are so many things to be grateful and thankful about. It's all about perspective. I mean, if you're like, well, I ain't rich. I ain't got the job I want. I ain't got this. I ain't got that. That's the wrong perspective. Change your perspective and it'll make you more grateful and thankful for everything that God has done for you. Amen. With that, we say greetings. Thank you for joining us for our Tuesday night online church services. We give all glory to God all the time for what he is doing through this, his global church body alliance. And as we normally do when we start, we'd like to say hello, welcome, salutations to our beloved, beautiful, majestic sister church in Garland, Texas, Oasis on the Mount, Church and Hill, etc., led by my brother, Pastor Chris Pipkin. Greetings, Oasis. Welcome. We're glad you've joined us this evening. We love you all so much. If you want to be a blessing to Oasis, we encourage you to visit their website, visit their Facebook page. The links to both of which are in the chat right now. It'll tell you uh, when you go to those links, everything that they got going on, everything that they're doing. Their church anniversary is coming up next month. Hallelujah. And so they can always use gifts, the gift of prayer. Financial gifts are fine as well, but the gift of prayer and um, the gift of fellowship, they can always use these things to help them celebrate the fact that they have been doing the Lord's work positively and effectively for another year. Hallelujah. We can't wait to fellowship with y'all on your church anniversary oasis. Also, hello and welcome to all of our beloved saints around the world. We appreciate y'all being here. If y'all want to be a blessing to us, Hit that invite button. Invite somebody to come out and worship with us on Tuesday night. Say, hey, they go live at 7 p.m. Tuesday, Eastern, every time. You get in, you get out, you get on with your life. And if they go over, because it's normally usually an hour, they go over it slowly by a little bit, probably because the Lord had something that he wanted us to hear that was more important than the six minutes that it took going over for service. Amen. So go on, spread that word, y'all. We appreciate it. And of course, we ask at this time that you please prepare your hearts, direct your attention to the screen for this week's announcement. Friends, we're excited to be partnered with the best new faith-based radio station in the world, BMC Radio, where they're reaching the unreachable. Just go to www.bmcradio.net to listen live every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you missed the live episode, you can still catch all the biggest shows on BMC Radio, including Benevolent Faith Ministries' own two shows, by going to the BMC On Demand page. Just go to bmcradio.net and click on the menu for more information. Benevolent Faith is excited to announce our brand new relationship with the mobile app known as Wisdom App where you have conversations that matter. Wisdom app is a new mobile app that gives you access to expert help when you need it most. When you download the app, it allows you to listen in real time and ask questions to experts in almost every area of life. From business and finance to fitness and fashion, from sports-based conversations to faith-based dialogue. So check out Benevolent Faith's new chat platform on the Wisdom app. It's called Speak On It, the Believer's Q&A, where we welcome you to ask questions directly about things related to the Bible and faith in Christ. We'll drop the topic and you come and speak about it. Download the Wisdom app in the Apple and Android store today and search for at Rev Rob, that's at R-E-V-R-O-B, and become part of our growing world community in Christ where everyone is invited to speak on it. Amen? Hope to see you there.
Amen. Amen. Thank you to everybody that continues to support BMC Radio and BFTV and all the other things that we've got going on. We are greatly appreciative. But tonight, my friends, tonight we're going to be coming out of the book of Psalms and covering various passages of scripture within it. And the gist or main thrust of our message is going to be based in two particular Psalms. That being Psalm 121, verses 1 to 4, and Psalm 88, out of which we'll be reading select verses. And in all instances, I'll be reading these texts like I normally do from the New Living Translation version of the Bible, which is my favorite version. And if you click on that Bible tab that you see, then you can read along in your favorite version as well. Amen? So, reading from Psalm 121, verses 1 to 4, the word of the Lord reads as follows. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tonight, my friends, I want to speak from the subject, help wanted. Help wanted. Let's look to the Lord. Father God in heaven, we are so grateful and thankful, Lord, that uh, you have given us another day in which we can keep the main thing the main thing, which is to glorify you and to magnify you and tell the world about how salvation is available to them as well. There are so many lost unbelievers out there that need to hear the gospel of the good news. And Lord, or the good news of the gospel, I should say. And Lord, there are also so many believers who need to be reminded of where their help comes from. Lord, oftentimes we get caught up in our fears and our anxieties and our frustrations, and we forget that in our efforts, our feeble efforts to try to fix whatever's going wrong, we forget that you hold all power and authority in your hand. And so if we would only just turn those problems over to you, not only will we be burdened from them emotionally, we'll be burdened from them authoritatively because you have the power to change them. So we can then rest in the knowledge of knowing that not only do we have to not carry that burden, you're carrying it for us and you will take care of it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, Lord, as we read these passages tonight and as we fellowship together, help us remember where to go when we're in situations where there's help wanted. Oh, Lord, you make all things new all the time. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight because you and you alone are our rock and redeemer, Lord. We just ask for the spirit of the living God, fall fresh and new this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray that we heart out there say amen. Amen and amen. Help wanted. You know, many people have been hired by employers based on their response to the employer's request for help wanted. I mean, we know what that means, right? It's a phrase businesses use, typically in the form of hanging a sign in the window that says help wanted. When that business or company is hiring or otherwise needs help, with their staff or personnel. And basically by saying that there's help wanted, a company is telling the world, hey, we need aid or support of some kind. Essentially, it is a request for assistance. So the business puts up the help wanted sign because they're appealing to the public for that assistance. Saints of God, I'm pretty sure that I don't have to tell you that in these days, the entire world should be holding up a help wanted sign to God, well, at least those who believe in God. With all the craziness going on in the world, wars and conflicts and food shortages and violence and crime and natural disasters and terrorism, economic uncertainty, unemployment, disease, yada, 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 you name it. With all the stuff that's going on, there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety in the world, even fear, dare I say. But as followers of Christ, 
It is precisely when things seem to be at their worst, trying to overwhelm us, that we have to hold up our help wanted sign so that we can get the assistance we need. We're appealing to God for that assistance. And these Psalms that we're about to examine tonight tell us in times of crisis, holding up our help wanted signs is the best thing we can do because of who is reading those signs, because of who we are making these appeals to, who we're addressing with those signs. And Psalm 121 verses 1 through 4 in particular gives us some key principles to live by when it comes to holding up our help wanted signs. In fact, these verses show us three specific ways that we can effectively wield our help wanted signs before the Lord. And I should say these verses as well as the verses we're going to read out of Psalm 88. They all show us how we can effectively wield our help wanted signs, holding them up so we can appeal to the Lord for assistance. Essentially, we do this by three different ways. Number one, knowing the source of our help. That's first. Secondly, knowing the scope of our help. And thirdly, keeping the connection to our help. So knowing the source of our help, knowing where it comes from, knowing the scope of our help, knowing what it encompasses, and then keeping the connection to our help, which is essentially keeping our connection to God. So let's talk about knowing the source of our help. Look at Psalm 121, verse 2. It says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. See, the psalmist knew that his help wasn't going to come from the hills. In other words, he knew that his help would not come from an invalid source. Now, somebody right now, the needle just skip. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? You know why? Because for so long in the black church and in other churches, this verse has been taught improperly. Notice what he is saying. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? He's not saying, as the other version says, I look to the hills from whence cometh my help, beyond the hills from whence cometh my help. We got a song, beyond the hills to where my help comes from. We got a whole song based on that. But it's the wrong premise. The psalmist is not saying that his help comes from beyond the hills. He's asking sarcastically, so what, am I supposed to look to the hills for my help? Is that where it's from? No, my help comes from the Lord. And some of y'all are like, I don't know about that, Rev. Bear with me. What we need to understand is that back when this psalm was written, see, context is always very important when you read the Bible. Back when this psalm was written, the hills were not a good place. They were a place of idolatry and false religion, and peril, danger. They were very dangerous, because think about it. First and foremost, they were places of idolatry and false religion. The hills were where pagan sects, not S-E-X, S-E-C-T-S, get your mind straight. It's where pagan sects went to worship their many gods, or even make sacrifices to those gods. And sometimes they would sacrifice some really improper things. Sometimes they would sacrifice humans to their gods. So it was a place in the hills where followers of Yahweh, the one true God, knew not to go because there was a whole bunch of treachery and paganism and sinfulness going on up in the hills. That's not where your help's going to come from. Also, as I mentioned, peril. The hills were very dangerous because it was where thieves would pop out from behind hiding places and rob innocent, unsuspecting travelers because there weren't any law enforcement in the hills to police the hills and keep the peace and provide justice. When you walked on them roads in the hills, you're taking your life in your own hands. Remember when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan? What happened in that parable? Dude was walking on the road and he got jumped on a road where there was no police 
or no uh, law enforcement presence. And that's what the hills were back in biblical times. In other words, the writer of this song knows that he will not find help in a false source. Don't miss that. That's still true today, y'all. None of the idol of the idols of the heathens of the world can offer them the help that they need. Money ain't gonna help them. Uh, human intelligence and training, that's not gonna help them. None of that's gonna help them. Only God can help us through those situations. And the psalmist sees the hills as a potential place, a place of danger rather than a potential source of help. We need to remember that. So verse one, where he says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? That's him asking a rhetorical question. He's saying, I know the source of my help ain't gonna come from them trifling hills or mountains over there. And we know that that's what he's saying by what he says next, as he provides the correct, the correct theological answer to his own question. Look at it. My help comes from the Lord. It's like, no, my help don't come from there. My help comes from the Lord. He knew the proper source of his help. Saying to God, when we are caught up in our fears and our anxieties, the mountains which represent our trials and troubles seem far too big for us to deal with in the moment. But faith asserts that the Lord is bigger than those mountains. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Y'all, that type of faith only comes from having a close, intimate relationship with God. Because when you have that type of connection to the infinite ruler of the universe, he is both willing and able to help you out in your time of need because no human problem is beyond the Lord's capacity to help you through it. Please remember that and please believe it. There's nothing that you can go through that God cannot handle and deal with effectively. No health issue, no financial issue, no personal emotional issue. There's nothing that God can't handle if only you will turn it over to him. Friends, knowing the source of your help is how you get access to the help you need. Think of it like this. If you got a toothache, then you know that the source of your help for that toothache is the dentist, right? You're not going to a fireman to help you with that toothache, right? Because that's not the right source of help for your problem. God is our source of help at all times and for everything we face. You already know what I'm gonna say, which is don't take it from me, take it from him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things. See that? So first, there's knowing the source of our help. But then secondly, there's also knowing the scope of our help. We got to know the scope of our help. In knowing the scope of our help, let's give consideration to verses three and four of Psalm 121. Because for one, these two verses tell us that God helps those who slip. God helps those who slip. Look at verse 3a. He will not allow your foot to slip. So what does that mean? That God ain't gonna let me be like, you don't have to make that scooby doo noise. No, that's not what it means. It's not literally slipping and falling, okay? What it means is that God won't allow you to slip into sin. He won't allow you to slip into discouragement. 
He won't allow you to slip into fear, to slip into anxiety and worry and concern. Basically, God won't allow us to slip in our faith. He won't allow it as long as you turn those things over to him. He provides sound, solid footing for you to stand on in times of trouble. Listen, the Lord knows how easy it is for us to slip in all of those respects I just said, sin, discouragement, fear, anxiety, and worry. He knows that, okay? But what we've got to remember, especially during times like these, when we can easily slip into worry and doubt and fear and anger over what's going on in the world and in our lives, is that God's presence is promised to us as followers of his son. God has promised to sustain us with his presence and his power. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5b. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So when you're feeling all alone while you're going through those trials and tribulations, remember, God's already promised, I'll never fail you, I'll never abandon you. And the only way you won't feel his presence is if you don't know him and you haven't embraced him in your life. That's the only way you won't feel his presence because he's already promised you that he will. So if you're not feeling God's presence in the midst of your trials and tribulations right now, maybe you need to re-examine your relationship with him because it's probably a case of you not being as close, as close to him as you thought. Remember, we said it's a close, intimate relationship. Look at um, Matthew 28, 20b. This is Jesus talking. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Saints of God, what both of those passages of text are telling you is that when the Lord saved you, he took responsibility for you. And he will see to it that responsibility is carried out. He's going to continue to uphold that responsibility until you are safely home with him in heaven. He's going to continue to see to it. Look at what Jesus told you. That's what to the end of the age means. It means until the end of time. So every issue that you're having, it ain't going to last. Because with God being with you and you having the proper relationship with him, he will in due time deal with that problem. Just continue to walk in faith. Just because you don't see him dealing with it today don't mean he's not going to deal with it. You have to have patience in your faith. You know, five minutes to us ain't nothing to God. 500 years to us is but a blink of God's eye. So the key for us is to have patience. And a lot of times we ain't got it. And we get impatient and we're waiting on God. And we feel like he ain't doing nothing. So we try to do stuff in our own power. Guess what's going to happen? It ain't going to work. Trust in him. Trust in his power and the promises he's already made. So God helps those who slip. But God also helps those who sleep. He helps those who sleep. Look at verse four. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. So not only does the Lord know that it's easy for us to slip, he knows that it's easy for us to sleep. See, there are times when we grow weary and want rest. There are times when we let our guard down and we get caught napping. Y'all ever heard that phrase in the streets or young people say, it'd be like, yo, don't sleep on such and such. Don't sleep on this. Don't sleep on that. It means don't overlook this thing or don't underestimate the significance or potential of this thing. That is never the case with God, y'all. He is always awake and active on our behalf. He doesn't grow weary, he doesn't get tired, and he doesn't fall asleep at the wheel. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, if you know all that, understand that there's no need for you to be weary or to worry. There is no need for you to fret. There is no need for you to lose not even one moment of sleep at any time because of this problem or another. Things should not plague your mind like that because God is always awake and constantly on the job. You go to sleep, get your Z's on, get your snoring on. Why? Because as you're resting and renewing yourself, which is what every human body needs, that's why we need sleep, 
God is still on the job. And that problem that you're worried about, he taking care of it even as you sleep because you trusted in him. Amen. So there's knowing the source of our help and there's knowing the scope of our help. Last one and I'm done, y'all. That's right. We're keeping it short tonight. We also have to engage in keeping the connection to our hope. Keeping the connection to our hope. And for this, now we're going to transition over to Psalm 88. And we encourage you to read along in the notes section because we put all of Psalm 88 in the notes section, the complete passage of a text from there. But for the sake of time here, we're only going to highlight three sections of that chapter. So I want y'all to look at Psalm 88, verses 1 to 2. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer. Listen to my cry. Then there's Psalm chapter 88, verse 9. My eyes are blinded by my tears. Each day I beg for your help, O Lord. I lift my hands to you for mercy. And then I want you to look at Psalm 88, 13. O Lord, I cry out to you. I will keep on pleading day by day. And, you know, let me give you all some real quick background on Psalm 88. This psalm is often considered the most desperate of all the psalms because it was prayed by a person who was going through some really tough times and crying out to God because of it. Yet even with all his problems, this man kept on praying. And recognizing how he prayed can help us when we face similar times of turmoil and trouble. I want us to take notice of the psalmist's courses of action in this passage of scripture and in particular at three aspects of his actions that we need to learn from and follow. And here's the first one. And that's that he prayed continually. He prayed continually. In each of these three passages we just read, Psalm 88 verses 1 and 2, Psalm 88 verse 9, Psalm 88 verse 13, we see this man constantly and repeatedly seeking the Lord's face. Look at verse 1. I cry out to you by day, I come to you at night. Verse 9, each day I beg for your help. O Lord, verse 13, I will keep on pleading day by day. I think y'all get the point. You can never stop appealing to God. You can never stop trying to have that dialogue with him, okay? Night and day, every day, all day, first thing. Don't ever give up and never stop praying. Don't ever give up appealing to him, which you do by prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And for those that know me, y'all know I'm getting ready to say it. Some people might think it's inappropriate. Tough. That's that don't stop, get it, get it prayer. Because you never stop praying. You pray about everything. I might pray, Lord, should I have this for lunch or that for lunch? That may seem immaterial or stupid to people. Like, don't be bothering God with that. Listen, we take everything to the Lord in prayer. Okay? You let him decide whether it's trivial or not. That's not for us to decide. Take everything to God in prayer. Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Don't miss that. Rejoice in our confident hope. That means that when things look bad around us, we're using our faith eyes and still having hope. And then be patient in trouble. I just talked about that, what, five, 10 minutes ago, about the key for our faith is being patient when there's trials and tribulations afoot. Because our time, our scope of time is different than God. God is not confined by the space-time continuum the way that we are. So you gotta be patient as you wait on him. And as you do that, as you rejoice and use your faith eyes, and wait on him in times of trouble, being patient. Keep 
on praying through all of it. Because that's how you're going to get to it. So, he prayed continually. Second, he prayed emotionally. He prayed emotionally. The one word you see in each of these three passages, Psalm 88, 1 and 2, Psalm 88, 9, Psalm 88, 13, is the word cry. And the Hebrew word that taken from this, or the Hebrew word that it represents means to shout and to shriek. Y'all know how a little child will shriek loudly when something's wrong, like if they get hurt or if they're upset? You ever seen a kid throw a tantrum in the supermarket and their they parents not handling it the right way? And the kid's like, ah, in the middle of the store? Think of that. That's the sensibility that this psalmist is talking about when he uses the word cry. Loud, piercing cry to the Lord that everybody's like, well, dang, that type of shriek. In other words, much like a little child, the psalmist was reaching up to the Lord. You hear a little kid shriek because they get hurt? What's the first thing they do? Ah, put their hands out and reach for the adult or the parent that's near to pick them up and go, oh, it's going to be okay. That's what he's doing, y'all. That's what this represents. This burden was heavy on him, and it touched him at the heart of his being. He was a broken man emotionally. Friends, emotion is a vital part of the effective prayer life, okay? Look at James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Earnest prayer. That means you're praying, Lord, God, Jesus, you're pouring your heart out to him. That's emotion. Look at Psalm 6, verse 6. I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. Hmm. We can take comfort that God cares about our emotional states, y'all. In fact, scripture tells us that human emotion and burdens touch the heart of the Lord. Look at Psalm 56, verse 8. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Our emotions matter to God. Of course they do. He's the one that gave them to us. So when we use them to cry out to him, please believe that he hears us. And please believe that it's okay for you to be emotional in your prayer. Don't think you have to be all solemn and somber in your prayer. No, God encourages us to be emotional in our prayer. Now don't be all out of bounds with it to where you angry or something and you going off on them or whatever. Have proper respect for who you're talking to. But it is okay to be emotional in prayer. We see that from this song. So, he prayed continually. He prayed emotionally. And he prayed intelligently. He prayed intelligently. Look at verse 1. Oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Y'all, he directed his prayer toward God and God alone. Look at that. Oh Lord, God of my salvation. He wisely knew where to find the true source of help. He smartly called out to the God who hears and answers the prayers of his saints. Jeremiah 33, 3 puts it this way. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That is an invitation from God. Yo, holla at me. I got what you need. God is asking us to do that. Isaiah 65, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Hallelujah. Do you understand what that's saying? God is saying to us, I already know what's on your heart. Confess it to me. Because as soon as you do, when them words first start coming out your mouth, 
I'm already on it. I'm already taking care of it. I just need for you to trust me in it. As you're uttering the prayer, knowing from Isaiah 65, 24, that I'm already going to be taking care of it. After you pray it, then let it go. You got to get your Keisha Coles on. Let it go. Let it go so that he can operate with it. Okay? Because God is a God who can do the impossible anytime and in any place. So it's only logical to take a position that's steeped in intelligence and which causes us to reach out and to call to him for help. Isn't that praying intelligently? Let me pray to God because I know he's the only one that got the power to do and to handle what I need him to do. So I'm going to go appeal to him because can't nobody else help me. That's smart thinking. That's in praying intelligently. So as I close here this evening, my friends, we don't need for the people of God to be timid and fearful or worried all the time. For what? As we realize that God is able where we are not, we can take solace in the fact that we're not able. It's okay to recognize Lord, I can't handle this. I need to turn it over to you. It's okay to do that. And we need to do that. We are not in control. We do not have all the answers. We meaning mankind, not just an individual. That's why it's so critical that we learn how to cast our cares upon the God who is in control. Control! God was in control way before Janet, okay? He already told us his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Give it to him because you can't handle it. He is the source of every last thing that we need in this life and in this world. So don't let what's going on in the world rob you of your faith in the power of God. Don't let what's going on in your life rob you of your faith in God's ability to handle that thing, he is still able, still in control, and still sitting on the throne. He is still the source to go to whenever there is help wanted. Amen? But listen, you are never going to get the help you need unless you first tap into the source of that help. And you can't do that unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because remember, he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if you want access to the source of help, you got to go through the proper channel to get that access. And that's by making Jesus your Lord and Savior. Here's your chance to do that. Is there one? Won't you come? Perfect opportunity. We're still only two weeks into the new year. If you haven't already made a decision this year to give your life to the Lord, there's no better time than right now. If you look around at the state of the world, you can see there's a lot of people holding up these help wanted signs. Lord, we need you help us. Whether it's because of worldly stuff, or whether it's because of stuff that's going on in their own lives. We all need that help. And if you're one who has not known the Lord, now's your chance to get that help. There's no better time. Is there one? Won't you come? Scripture says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Don't let Jesus stand on the porch knocking at your door. Open the door of your heart. Let him in so that he can give you the help that you need. Is there one? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We always applaud at this time for no other reason than the fact that the seed has been planted. Again, the ground has been tilled. All we're doing is going bloop. Bloop, bloop, dropping the seeds in the ground. And our job is done. God is the one that gives the increase. God is the one that grows out of the soil that which is maturing. So now that we've planted that seed, let God grow you and mature you. It's never too late to get the help you need when you know that help is wanted. Amen.